Hi all. Today our topic is a different take on the classic Paladin Sorcerer build, one of the most straightforward Gish characters in 5e that clearly and easily exceeds the power of a base class. In this case though, we're going to be using Bard as our second class, in order to build for a totally separate focus of being a speechifier, peacemaker, and all-around hero, in the vein of Mass Effect's Paragon Commander Shepard meets Shrek? yet still maintaining excellent combat effectiveness and party utility. It's very likely that this will be one of my mechanically strongest characters, and I'm okay with that since it fits the role of the protagonist character so well. To briefly explain, a Paladin full caster multiclass works like this. Paladins can smite with any kind of spell slot, so if you swap into a full casting class sometime after Paladin 2 when they get smite, rather than being weaker than your base class, you can keep up or even be stronger than a standard paladin because you have far more spell slots than a straight paladin build. More smites means more damage, and we also can learn utility or roleplay spells without having to worry about our combat effectiveness because our spell slots can just go towards smites if need be. We are going to be using one of the classes I mentioned in my first video as being a bit on the overpowered side, namely the Eloquence Bard. But because we'll be taking this subclass later in our character's career, I think the effect on gameplay is more measured. That is to say, tier 3 characters are supposed to have abilities that allow us to roll high on skill checks, so getting such an ability at level 9 doesn't bother me in the same way getting it at level 3 does. Having said that, let's get to the build. For our race, even though our character is going to be starved for ability score increases, we're not taking variant human or custom lineage. No, we're going with the Firbolg from Monsters of the Multiverse. A race that couldn't be more suited to our peace-loving protagonists, both in lore and mechanics. We'll gain four great features, starting with Firbolg Magic, which now adds Detect Magic and Disguise Self to our spell list, with Disguise Self improved a bit to match our tall character, and gives us a free casting of either spell once a day. Having more spells known is great, but particularly for paladins who are not known for their self, being able to hide in heavy armor is very useful. If nothing else, a free casting of Detect Magic every day will get used, and not having to spend a smite-friendly spell slot, nor a spell preparation slot on Detect Magic, is hard to complain about. Next we get Hidden Step, a feature that might seem a little underwhelming. Why is it useful to be invisible for 6 seconds or less since it expires before my next turn? Well, perhaps there are a few times you absolutely must run across a doorway without being seen, but we're actually going to use this feature to turn invisible and then make an attack with an advantage right away. If the ability said, give yourself advantage on one attack proficiency bonus times per day, we'd think it was at least adequate. This has more uses than just advantage, but it has that clear combat use that will help us reduce the need for a high strength score. Not to mention, it gives us a way to disengage as a bonus action, since enemies who can't see you can't make attacks of opportunity against you. We also gain Powerful Build. This might not come up as often, but we are a Strength character who will have 16 Strength for most of our career. According to the Strength rules on page 176 of the Player's Handbook, our Powerful Build feature increases our carrying capacity from 240 pounds to 480 pounds, and our ability to push, drag, or lift goes from 480 pounds to 960 pounds. If we ever cast Enlarge Reduce on ourselves, a spell we can get by character level 9, that limit increases to 1920 pounds. Even GMs who don't use weights or carrying capacity can often be persuaded to allow ridiculous feats of strength when you remind them that you can push, drag, or lift, say, an adult riding horse without needing to make a check. Lastly, we gain Speech of Beast and Leaf, an odd and flavorful feature that actually fits perfectly with our build. We are going to be making charisma checks a lot, and this feature specifies that we can talk to beasts, capital P plants, so plant creatures, and vegetation, uh, and they will understand us. We can't understand them back, but that's not important. This feature specifically tells the GM that we are going to be making charisma checks against beasts, plant creatures, and vegetation, and even gives us advantage. Our speechifying powers grow ever more, and in such a charming way. Love it. It is also worth noting that Firbolgs can live up to 500 years. I imagine our hero as a character in her 3 or 400s, perhaps someone who has seen a lot of the history of this world, and that's how she came upon her peace-loving nature. After all, who better to talk everyone down from the brink 
and someone who's been through it all before. For our background, I'm going to suggest the Acolyte background even if we'll swap out some of the skills. It fits our theme and adding two languages, for a total of four, will again help us talk to more people in a given setting. We'll need a deity, likely a nature or peace god like Melora the Wild Mother, or the Everlight in Exandria, Biori or Rao in Eberron, or Myleki, Sylvanas, maybe even Lyra, the goddess of joy, in the Forgotten Realms. You get the idea, somewhere between a compassion deity and a nature deity seems about right. For skills, we don't have many, though we'll get another one at level 7. We'll take Persuasion and Athletics from Paladin, then Acolyte comes with Insight, but I think we'll need to swap in Deception as well, a skill we've used to survive as a young for bold using Disguise Self. Our stat line will be 16 Strength, 16 Charisma, 14 Constitution, 10 Wisdom, 10 Intelligence, and 8 Dexterity. While we could have had 12 Wisdom, which is mechanically slightly better, I decided not to dump intelligence here. Many GMs and many players think of 8 intelligence as the mark of a character on the dim side, whereas with 10 intelligence characters, it's generally understood that your hero is about as smart as the average player. We're going to be making a lot of speeches, I think adding in having to play dumb will just complicate matters, though this is very much up to each player to decide. Now on to our class, where we begin as a paladin. Since we'll be a caster multiclass later on, and we can't afford to take Warcaster, I think a big old two-handed sword is in order. At Paladin 1, we gain Heavy Armor Proficiency, Divine Sense, and the excellent Lay on Hands, but not a whole lot else. At Paladin 2, we gain Paladin Spells and Smite. We can swap our spells every day, so there's no hard and fast rules, but we'll definitely want Bless and Cure Wounds. Command fits into our Speak First, Fight Later ethos, though the fear-inspiring and action-eating Wrathful Smite makes sense as a way to force enemies to retreat. Still, you can swap these out. Sometimes you'll need Shield of Faith, sometimes Protection from Evil and Good, and we are totally the type of character to officiate weddings with ceremony. But the only spell we are really going to rely on is Bless. We also have to pick a fighting style, and this one is a little weird. While defense won't serve you wrong, and interception is powerful and perfectly on brand for our do-gooding paladin, I'm actually going to take Blessed Warrior. Though less valuable if anyone else has guidance, nobody will think twice about you offering a prayer before starting a speech, and that extra d4 will help with all of your persuasion checks. In addition, we can pick up Thaumaturgy. This often overlooked spell has one specific feature we are after. We can triple our voice volume. Nothing says, listen to me, like the eight-foot-tall half-giant speaking with a divine microphone. Personally, I think, as one of the most powerful classes in the game, paladins will be fine taking a less useful fighting style. But this is up to you. If someone else in your party has guidance, absolutely go with interception, great weapon fighting, or defense. At Paladin 3, we take our Sacred Oath, which is indeed the less used Oath of Redemption from Xanathar's Guide. While it can be tricky to roleplay in some campaigns, I once heard it described as a therapist paladin, and that's not wrong, work with your GM and your party to agree on an understanding of how vows of peace, innocence, patience, and wisdom can play out in your game. The goal isn't to constantly be laying down arms while your party gets into a fight, but to acknowledge that your character is at least going to try resolving conflict with words whenever possible, though this won't apply to supernatural evil that can't be reasoned with. The GM may wish to have such evil be a periodic part of the campaign, so that not every session is bogged down in, but you guys, should we really be fighting? Yet at level 3 we get some not great spells, but some amazing channel divinity options. Rebuke the Violent is a bit situational, but can be game changing if your enemy lands a critical strike or rolls max damage. And of course the ability scales very well as enemies get more and more powerful attacks over the levels. But the reason we came to Redemption Paladin in the first place is actually the other feature, Emissary of Peace, which adds a stellar plus 5 to our persuasion checks for a full 10 minutes as a bonus action. Now we've got a way to roll plus 10 to persuasion checks every short rest, and our character concept can really come into its own. We do need a side note about the persuasion skill though. There are two main ways to consider how the talking skills are ruled in a game, so first let's talk about rules as written. 
page 244 of the Dungeon Master's Guide, lays out how NPCs have one of three starting attitudes, friendly, indifferent, or hostile. It is also mentioned later on that page that a typical creature's attitude does not shift more than one step in a single interaction, whether the shift is temporary or permanent. The rules for making talking skill checks on the next page give us the example of what rolling a 20 does, where friends will take major risks for us while hostile, almost foes, will only do what we want if it involves no risk or sacrifice. The point here is that the talking skills are not mind control, and even though we can make a plus 11 or higher with guidance, starting from level 3, and the rules don't specify what an NPC does with a persuasion check of 30 or higher, for example, I just want to lay out that the GM does have the tools to restrict the power of talking skills. However, the second way, and in my experience the most common way, that GMs run NPCs is just to inhabit the character as best they can without considering the mechanical starting attitude, then interpret the dice results as they fall. Whether your character can, say, convince warring tribes, aka hostile NPCs at best, to make peace is totally up to your GM and how well you phrase your arguments, but I just want to recognize that the GM is not beholden to derail their campaign just because you make good speeches. Still, I hope you'll get some moments to shine with your heroic monologues nonetheless. Okay, back to the build. At level 4, we're going to take a feat, Great Weapon Master. This is our one concession to pure combat effectiveness. When we combine the Bless spell with our Hidden Step feature to gain advantage, this will be well worth it. Too bad we can't make bonus action attacks while using Hidden Step, but even so. Luckily, Hidden Step doesn't use our concentration. We are an ability score improvement starved build, we only get 4 ASIs total, so this is the only feat we can afford, but it's fantastic as everyone knows. At level 5, we get second attack and second level spells, and the delightful roleplaying opportunities of the Intelligent Six Fine Steed, the donkey to our Shrek. Redemption Paladins gain the quite excellent Hold Person and totally on-brand Calm Emotions spells, great for perhaps talking out a combat that has already begun. Keep Zone of Truth in your back pocket for obvious truth-seeking reasons, and don't forget about the also do-gooder appropriate Warding Bond. At level 6, we've got one of the best abilities in the game, the Aura of Protection. Plus 3 to all saves, amazing! Share it with your allies even more so. And that's it, we're done with Paladin. It's too bad about the Redemption Oath's level 9 spells, which are excellent, but we've got to get started on our multi-class. At level 7, we are taking Bard 1, gaining an extra skill, I'll take Perception, more spells, more slots to smite with, and a totally appropriate Bardic Inspiration. Depending on your campaign, Comprehend Languages might be handy, but mostly we want Healing Word and Dissonant Whispers, a spell that tells enemies to run away but also gives opportunity attacks to our allies depending on what we need. Silent Image is another excellent pick to try to stave off combat by fooling our enemies. Long Strider can be shared with your steed. We've got some good options, though Bless will still probably be our go-to first level spell. Level 8, we're at Bard 2, grab another spell, albeit we'll probably want to start swapping the first level spells out soon to get higher level options. And then finally we're level 9, we get our Bard subclass, and suddenly our heroine goes from a somewhat persuasive peacenik to the proper caliber of commander I end intractable intergenerational conflict with my words, Shepard. This is because all at the same level, our proficiency bonus increases to plus 4, we are going to put expertise in persuasion, and we are going to take the College of Eloquence as our subclass, giving us the Silver Tongue ability. We went from rolling with Guidance, plus 7 to plus 15 to Persuasion, so totaling between 8 and 35, to rolling with Guidance, plus 12 to plus 20 to Persuasion, and no rolls below 10, so totals are always between 22 and 40. It's a big jump. We can also take Enhance Ability at Bard 3 to give us advantage on these rolls, though the math works out similarly to Guidance, because we can't roll below 10. Uh, though if your GM finds the 1 minute time limit on Guidance to be an issue for speeches or peace talks or what have you, Enhanced Ability lasts an hour, which should help. We also get access to spells like Enlarge Reduce. Remember, you can push, drag, or lift 1920 pounds while enlarged. Uh, invisibility, Locate Object, or depending on your character's morality, Detect Thoughts, and Suggestion which our Unsettling Words feature will help you land. Plenty of options, and unlike single-class bards, we don't mind that there are no serious damage spells available. 
At level 10, we're a Bard 4, and we'll take plus 2 to Charisma, further boosting our Charisma rolls, but also helping with our Aura of Protection at plus 4 to all saves. So I doubt your party will begrudge you the slightly lower Strength score. Also another Inspiration die. We also gain access to 4th level spell slots for the first time, which are the hardest hitting smites available to us at 5d8 damage. At level 11, we're a Paladin 6, Bard 5 and the equivalent of an 11th level feature for us is being able to cast 3rd level spells, which thankfully are fantastic. Leoman's Tiny Hut is a great addition to any party, and Hypnotic Pattern will help you incapacitate your foes, then perhaps tie them up or knock them out rather than killing them. Plus we get our Bardic Inspirations back on a short rest now, and their D8s. We might also want to take Tongues for better communication. At level 12, we are evenly split at Paladin 6, Bard 6. We get Counter Charm, and I still don't want to talk about it. But Unfailing Inspiration is a huge improvement to our inspirations, since they are kept unless the roll succeeds. This is amazing for any other minus 5 plus 10 martial characters, and just darn good for any other inspiration use. But somehow we also get another feature, Universal Speech, which we can use once a day and spend a spell slot to use again. It allows four creatures within 60 feet to understand us for an hour. It doesn't say that you can understand them, but just like with our Fervolg ability speech of Beast and Leaf, what matters is that they can hear us, not vice versa. A fantastic improvement, even if we'll still need the tongue spell or comprehend languages to be able to have full language neutral communication. At level 13, we get Bard 7 and pick up Dimension Door and Polymorph or even greater invisibility, albeit it's less needed because of Hidden Step. Plus, more spell slots, and a higher proficiency bonus. At level 14, at Bard 8, we'll max out our Charisma. 5 Inspirations every short rest, plus 5 to all saves for your party, and our Persuasion score nearly maxes out at rolls between 26 and 44, with Guidance and Silver Tongue, depending on if you use Emissary of Peace. With just Emissary of Peace up, you can't roll below a 30. I hope you need to convince gods to join your side, because that's the territory you can roll into here. At level 15, we're Bard 9, and we get access to Teleportation Circle, hopefully somebody in your party already had it, and Synaptic Static, which is still great for the concentration-free debuff, even with lower damage. Gish, Modify Memory, and even Dominate Person, again depending on your character's morality, are there if you got to fix your foes. The Dream spell says that you can converse, so arguably you can make persuasion checks with your hated enemies, so there's potential there. Raise Dead doesn't hurt to have, nor Scrying. Great options, even if not life-changing. At level 16, we're getting our around level 17 capstone of sorts, Bard 10. Such a huge level. Add two more expertise, perhaps Athletics or Deception or Perception, then improve your Bardic Inspiration die to D10s, then take two spells from any class anywhere, level 5 or below. For pure power, we could take Counter Spell, and of course, Find Greater Steed is entirely on theme, or even Summon Draconic Spirit. Holy Weapon, Circle of Power, also appropriate. While of Force, Bigby's Hand, you know the drill. A lot of fantastic options that will vary by character. At level 17, we're a Bard 11. We gain access to Hero's Feast, Find the Path, Mass Suggestion, see the morality question again, but this can end fights with words, so it fits. And the ever popular Otto's Irresistible Dance. Still good options, and we max our proficiency bonus so we can top out our persuasion rolls at no less than minimum 28 to maximum 46 with guidance. Seems normal, no big deal. At level 18, we'll take Bard 12 and raise our strength score. I know we've made it this far with 16 strength, but why not? Level 19, we create Bard 13, and we get another mini capstone with the ability to cast Force Cage, but who doesn't love Morden Kingdom's Magnificent Mansion, Teleport, and Resurrection? At level 20, one of the reasons I wanted to make sure we split Paladin 6, Bard 14 was because this is such a big level for Bards, Bard 14, the perfect capstone. We get a 9th level spell slot. We get Infectious Inspiration to finalize our Wordsmith legacy as we can keep our inspirations bouncing around the party. And then we get, oh yes, two more Magical Secrets. Contingency and Heal are good options. Then Simulacrum comes to mind, 
since you can send your duplicate off to use persuasion checks to end wars in other places without the simulacrum having to expend its one use spell slots. And then grab plane shift so you can send your duplicate off to end wars in other planes. What's that? A war between the mind flayers and the gith? Yeah, we can tackle that, no problem. The blood war between hell and the abyss? Yeah, we can fix that in a week. Definitely what my character will be doing in retirement. This build does require a particular level of buy-in from the GM and the other players to make sure it's not actively preventing their enjoyment of, say, a dungeon crawl. But I love the image of a Mass Effect-style protagonist who can bring warring factions together against a common foe. And who doesn't enjoy all that warmth and restoration coming from the humble for Bulg, the gentle giant? I'm a fan. And I love this build still gets all the same power bumps in a single class build. It's still one of the stronger combat characters you can make, but it has a wholly different focus on diplomacy and working out problems without violence. That said, I hope you enjoyed the build, and I am curious what you'd do with a character like this in your party, as a GM or a fellow player. Let me know in the comments. Consider liking and subscribing. And remember, never trust a rickety rope bridge.